I'm Batman. Who are you? My name is Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. His name's Bond. James Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. James, James Bond. Bond. I'm Batman. Bond. 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 I'm Batman. Bond. This is the Batman vs. James Bond show. The show covering everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. And now, here's your host, Brian Thomas. Welcome back, everyone, to an all-new episode of the Batman vs. James Bond show. I am your host, Brian Thomas. Thanks for joining me. This is the show where we talk about everything related to Batman and James Bond movies. That's right, everything movie-related in the James Bond and Batman-related universe. Sometimes we throw in a little bit of comic information in there just because, well... That's where the backstories came from, but yeah, this is Strictly Movies. Um, For all you newbies out there, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm not sure how you found the show, but uh, we're glad to have you. Um, Thank you, buddy, to passing you on to this show. I I hope you're as entertained as they are. Uh, For everybody who's been joining me since episode one, you know who you are. Welcome back, and uh, good to have you. I hope everybody had a great week. Um, Yeah, it's been quite a long week, and um, if you haven't noticed, the uh, episode is is a uh, it's it's a day behind and let me explain that to you um sometimes there are technical difficulties and sometimes when you have a windows pc yes i am a windows user but i am an apple guy at heart because everything i have my iphone ipad whatever anyway let me get through this real quick so i've had this windows pc p- computer laptop whatever it's called now notebook i don't know and it i've had it since 2010 to it'll be about six years in august as a matter of fact and it is running windows 7 which i love and then somehow some way my baby gave out on me last night and uh yeah i said my baby because that everything is on there and um i might as well have been james bond and q just kind of hanging out in uh underground at the q labs because silva specter somebody hacked me no i'm kidding i don't know if they hacked me but my computer just froze the episode was all recorded, and here I am. I found a backup computer. Luckily, my lovely wife has one that I had to, um, you know, fit some programs into. And but here we are. I'm going to make sure that we have an episode for the week because so far we are in episode 11 or 12. I think it's episode 12, but I am going to make it. I'm going to commit that I have a new episode almost every single week for you guys. It is a day late, so I do apologize for that. But having said that, now you know why, and now you know why I'm probably in kind of a grumpy mood. But we have lots of James Bond and movie news to talk about. We have a lot of Batman news to talk about. So now I'm relieved. See, this is like therapy because I just get to talk about what I love because like you guys, I am a fan. I love doing this. That's why I do it. Before we get started, I'd just like to remind everyone to please, please subscribe to the Batman vs. James Bond show on iTunes and leave a nice little review there for me. Uh, five stars, you know, just a nice little comment. Just let me know how I'm doing. Biggest thing you can do for me is share this episode share every episode that i put out there with your friends share on social media just you know favorite it whatever i i don't care if you have to go into an itunes store notice how i said apple itunes store and just you know just put the link in there for batman versus james bond show that'd be perfect anyway so let's get down to business um like i said lots and lots of things to get to our first news story this week is going to be Let me phrase it this way. It's more of a rumor right now. And for all you newbies out there who've never, you know, had a chance to listen to this show, um, let me say this. How I treat rumors is pretty simple. A rumor is a rumor. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's, you know, when a rumor is put out there, it's not, it hasn't been confirmed. Okay. So when a news story breaks, you know, even if it's put out there by multiple sources until it is actually confirmed by the actor, confirmed by the studio, say Warner Brothers, MGM, the representatives for, say, you know, Ben Affleck, Daniel Craig, whomever, then I treat it as a rumor until otherwise said. So we are treating this first story as a rumor. So it has been reported by a tabloid called the Daily Mail. This one's out of UK. They reported that Daniel Craig has rejected a huge contract extension to return as James Bond, telling executives he's done 
playing the world's most famous secret agent. Um, the Daily Mail also went on to state that the four-time Bond turned down an estimated $100 million to return, including profit sharing, producing credits, and endorsement deals. Quoted saying, Daniel is done, pure and simple. He had told people after shooting this that this would be his final outing, but the film company still felt he could come around after Spectre if he was offered a money deal. Well, that's not the case. So... Here we are again with the speculation rumors last week. It was Tom Hiddleston meeting, you know, with the James Bond producers. Now we have Daniel Craig in, you know, what possibly, possibly turning down a hundred million dollars. Now, all money aside, okay, that, that just let's look at the facts right here, okay? Going back to October, November, when right before Spectre was being released into theaters, right around the same time that it was released. Daniel Craig went on record saying, you know, I'd rather slash my wrists than, you know, play James Bond again. And, you know, I want nothing to do with it, that kind of whole deal. So he was fed up with it. I am always going to be on the bandwagon Daniel Craig because I still think he's one of the best James Bonds to portray the part ever. Um, You know, Sean Connery fans, I know you'll, you know, you can, you can argue that. And I can, you know, I'm willing to hear your argument for that. But just the material and the scripts that Daniel Craig has been given and what he has done with that, the emotion that he shows in this part as the character, I think that, you know, hands down, he is the J- iconic James Bond as to date. Now, um, how he how he's going about doing this, about, you know, whether he wants to sign on again, I can't say that I I totally agree with it. I don't know the whole circumstances, though, too. For all I know, you know, maybe he was – that's his sense of humor saying, oh, well, you know, I'd rather slash my wrist or whatever. It's a little dark. Um, you know, even going back to the days of Sean Connery, you know, I mean, you look at how tired he got after he did Dr. No, From Usher With Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice, and that's five James Bond movies in a span of however many years – you would have to get a little bit tired, especially as an actor. Daniel Craig is 48 years old. Now, having said that, um, $100 billion is quite an offer. Um, I don't know about, you know, I don't think it's about the money, it, obviously. I think more or less it's just that he's tired, he's done with it, he put all he can, he's done everything he can with this character. Spoiler alert for any of you who haven't seen Spectre, um, you know, it, it the movie tied up loose ends in a way. Um, it left James Bond in a spot where they could do they could continue the story just a little bit more with Blofeld and Madeline Swan, or it just could be okay. James Bond left Secret Service. He drove off into the sunset with Madeline Swan in the Aston Martin DB5. That's it. That's your James Bond story. Move on to the next one. And my question is also about how they're going about this. When I say how they, I'm talking about Eon Productions. I'm talking about Barbara Broccoli, Michael G. Wilson, and sounds like Sam Mendes might have a hand in this in some way. Even if he doesn't direct, it would be interesting to see if he does end up at least having you know producer credits. Maybe he's an executive producer. Maybe he's going to be like a Christopher Nolan setting it up for say the next director because he you know he obviously seems to have a passion for it. He might not have the time to direct it, and maybe. He's out of fresh ideas, but he can have some kind of good input on it. So let's just say that in theory, at least in my little world, I'm going to say, what if they really did meet with Tom Hiddleston um, last week or within the last week or so? The producers met with him and they're saying, "Okay, well, this is what we have. This is what we want you for. Uh, Daniel Craig's not coming back. And, you know, what do you think about our ideas? They pitched him the ideas about how they want to take the future of James Bond and how they want to introduce him. And maybe, maybe not. Maybe Hiddleston said, oh, you know what? Maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I just I I want to do something else because this is quite a commitment for this because you're talking about maybe even nine to ten years of doing this. I mean, you had Daniel Craig on it's up to ten years now as this character. And like I said, that's a long time. And Daniel Craig is married to Rachel Wise. Um, as far as I know, he has kids. But, you know, maybe he's, like I said, he's put everything he's had into this character and maybe he feels like he can't offer anything else. So going back to Hiddleston, what if Hiddleston, you know, didn't like the ideas? Maybe something didn't work out. Maybe he's, you know, maybe he's waiting for a money offer, better money offer or something else. And at the same time, the producers, you, you see where I'm going with this theory. The producers is like, OK, well, maybe we'll try to get Daniel back. Maybe we'll just offer him a boatload of money and maybe he'll come back because, you know, Hiddleston might not like what we have. And we need to get this movie rolling. And we know that we can. Daniel does attract audiences. He does, you know, make money. 
his Bond movies do make money, okay? So they offer him this $100 million offer, whatever it may be, for one to two films, and Daniel just says, no, it's not about the money. I don't want it. So what do you think? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's a theory, like I said. Um, I... Who knows? Maybe this offer came before Tom Hiddleston. So maybe they offered him the $100 million, and now that that's off the table, now they're moving on to Tom Hiddleston, and Hiddleston could be the next James Bond. I'm I'm all ears about what you guys have to say about this. I mean, is Daniel Craig being – it's not about being greedy. Is he being selfish? I mean, can, can you take it that way? I mean, a lot of the fans are just like, well – you know, everything I've read on social media, they everybody wants Daniel Craig to come back. Um, amazing because back in 2005 when it was announced that, you know, Daniel Craig would be playing James Bond after Pierce Brosnan, no one wanted Daniel Craig. Now it's everybody's on the Daniel Craig bandwagon. And I mean, ever since I've watched Casino Royale, I'm, I've been on the bandwagon. I mean, I love him. I think he's awesome. And, um, you know, I think I, I'd be sad for him to leave the James Bond franchise. I really would. At the same time, um, I really don't know what else he could really do with that story arc. I, I know what I would like him to do. I know I would love him to do something like out of the book. Um, what What's it? Um, you only live twice. And apparently, you know, he went off and, you know, he went after Blofeld and all kinds of other things. But in my own little world, if, you know, I had to like kind of write a brief script for this, I would say, okay, Madeline Swan and Daniel and James Bond went off and they went off to live their life. And somehow, Blofeld got kicked near he got you know broken out of prison and all of a sudden you know he goes after they they kill Madeline and then this forces James Bond to come out of retirement and Bond goes after Blofeld for one last time and there's your final adventure in my world like I said in if I had hopes if I had a wish list of what I would want for the final Daniel Craig James Bond that would be it but I don't think we're gonna have a chance to see this um it is interesting also that unlike, say, like an actor like Pierce Brosnan, if we all remember about what happened there, he was contracted for another movie after Die Another Day. But what ended up happening is Eon Productions decided to go in another direction. So, you know, even though Die Another Day, you know, it did, I believe it did well at the box office, but it obviously, you know, everybody's like, OK, well, you know, Pierce, we appreciate what you did, but. Yeah, we're moving on. And I'm sure even to this day, after what I've read with interviews with Pierce Brosnan, he was pretty hurt about that. So it's it's a different set of circumstances. It's a different ball game because um I think we can all say the Daniel Craig James Bond movies are have been more successful. If you, you know, adjust for inflation, I still say that, you know, they have been more highly successful. They've gotten not just regular James Bond fans in there, they've also gotten new fans in there, fans of Daniel Craig or just like ladies who love to, you know, look at eye candy because, you know, let's face it, Daniel Craig is in still great, amazing shape. So as for Tom Hiddleston, right now he's actually denying that, you know, there's anything going on with the whole James Bond, you know, him becoming the next James Bond. He even like revealed in an interview that he finds it difficult to cope with the rumors about him becoming the next James Bond. Um, he was quote saying, it's a weird thing to have to deal with. Um, having unreal conversations with people about this because I don't know where the rumors have sprung from. Is he denying it or is he not denying it? That is the question here. I honestly think that he's being he's being quiet about it. He almost he almost has to be because maybe by some small chance Daniel Craig comes back and then they end up going with Hiddleston. Maybe Hiddleston is respecting Daniel Craig. Or at the same time, you know, it's just the the deal's been done. Because for all we know, when when this is what I believe. When an article breaks on in the news, or a news story, let's say, breaks out on the news, I think it's already done with. Take Ben Affleck becoming Batman for the new Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice movie. I strongly believe, and I, as far as I know, that the deal with Ben Affleck was it was done long ago before we even knew about it. As a matter of fact, you know, a couple episodes back, I mentioned that the producers said after the whole Christian Bale Dark Knight trilogy that they knew who they wanted to go with. They wanted to go with Ben Affleck. So at the same time, it's like, OK, well, maybe they already knew that they wanted to go with Hiddleston. And, you know, if they said Craig's not going to be the guy, doesn't want to be the guy anymore, that's cool. We have a backup plan. We, we have a new direction we can move in. There's infinite possibilities. Let's look at Hiddleston and so forth. So, like I said, let me know what you guys think. I'd be very curious to hear what you have to say. Is Craig finally out? Are you finished with Craig? Do you want Hiddleston to be the new guy to don the tuxedo and martini glass uh, and Walter PBK? Um, 
Or do you want somebody different? Let me know. Hit me up on social media at Batman versus Bond on Twitter. All right. Now, moving on to the next story here. Um, This one is for the Batman fans out there. So in this last week, there's also been a big change over at Warner Brothers DC Comics. Um, Not just the logo. By the way, that logo is pretty badass looking, might I say. It's a good throwback. Um, Can't really critique a logo, but if I had to, I would say it's a 10 out of 10. Great throwback. So it wasn't just the logo. Per The Hollywood Reporter, the studio has set DC Comics Chief Creative Officer Jeff Johns and WB Executive Vice President John Berg to co-run DC Films. They're going to be serving as the first executives in charge of running the studio's slate of DC Comics adaptations. Now, here's a little background about Jeff Johns. He's been involved since Man of Steel, serving as what The Hollywood Reporter called a brain trust. Um, Berg, he had already worked on Batman vs. Superman, Wonder Woman, and now Justice League. Um, going back to Johns, he was co-writing a standalone Batman movie with Ben Affleck, and Berg also worked with Affleck in Argo and the upcoming movie Live by Night. So what does this all mean? Well, pretty much it means that DC Films just finally found their Kevin Feige. Now, who is Kevin Feige? Now, if you're DC uber nerd out there you know you know you all know about the marvel cinematic universe and you know about there's a gentleman over there by the name of kevin feige who is supposed to be the brains behind the whole marvel cinematic universe and it's a guy i respect um i don't agree with the whole shared universes i i'm all about more standalone films and you know if you want to have some movies come together that's cool I think that sometimes it can be and or ends up to the point of just being like a TV series, like an ongoing TV series for the big screen. Those are just my thoughts. But like I said, I do respect this guy, Kevin Feige, because he has put out some he has produced some really great movies out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, I said it. a DC Batman fan said that he likes Marvel movies. There you go. There you have it. Anyway, um, so yeah, Johns and Berg are like the new Kevin Feige of DC films. This, in my mind, is a good thing because they're going to be the ones running the DC films. They're going to manage the genre streams and report directly to the WB president, Greg Silverman. Um, it's a very wise decision if you look at it because this whole time since Man of Steel, my, who has been calling the shots? Okay, who has been calling the shots behind you know how they how DC films is going to organize their universe? Okay, so they decided to make Man of Steel. That's great. But what direction did they want to take it after that? Sure, we had our Easter eggs in there, but was it all, was it Zack Snyder? Was he the one to be, you know, the new Kevin Feige of DC? A lot of people used to think so, but I would say that, you know, you can't put that kind of trust into a director. And, you know, a director can only focus on that one movie. And sure, they can, you know, set something up. But at the same time, you have to have like an actual producer who kind of like a captain who can kind of say okay this is where this is point a this is point b this is point c and this is the this is our final mission this is or this is what our mission is going to be if you will and you know it obviously wasn't christopher nolan because while he wrote and produced man of steel um he didn't stick around aside from being an executive producer on batman v superman and that's about as, as much the extent that he had with involvement um david s goyer all he did was pretty much write Man of Steel or helped write Man of Steel and Justice League. Now Goyer, you know, is doing whatever he's doing. So once again, it all leads back to the question: Who was really, you know, deciding, you know, which course of action DC, the DC universe, would take? Well, some will still say it's Zack Snyder, and now. After all the events of Batman v Superman, and if you want my listen to my full review, if you haven't already, go back and listen to episode, I believe it's three or four. It's a whole Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice review. I'm not going to get into the review right now, but I will say that I was in between on that film. I think I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. I still stand with that. Um, had some, It had so much potential, but at the same time, it was the, the editing, the jumping of the story, and too, much, too many stories going on with that movie. I think if they would have just done a set-up Batman film, just a standalone, which leads into the Justice League, you had... If you would have had Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and then they finally meet up at the end of one of those movies, and then they form the Justice League... I would have been down with it. I think that would have been perfect. But DC, you know, Warner Brothers decided to go in a different direction. It was a ballsy direction, and it's still getting them to where they need to be. But at the same time, they might have jumped the gun a little bit. 
So, you know, we'll all, I think we can all agree that if you love Batman v Superman, awesome. If you didn't like Batman v Superman, well, you know, it sucks for you at the same time. That's that's your opinion. Um, but I can all I think we can all agree that, you know, there was very there was a lot of mixed reception with that. The critics bashed it. Even the audiences, they didn't have quite the um reception that the studio had hoped for so as a studio what do you do well you need to regroup you need to reorganize you need to you know need to get things straightened out so that's exactly what they're doing yes these guys are in-house yes they've had involvement in the other movies so at least they are aware of you know what's going on at the same time though if you would have brought somebody new from outside of dc warner brothers I wonder if it would have shaken things up a little bit and maybe had a fresh perspective on it. So that's one worry that I do have. At the same time, though, I think these guys, I believe it was Jeff Johns that helped supper, or helped um, create the DC television universe, like Arrow, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, um, all those. And believe me, I am a big Arrow fan because, like I said, I am a Batman fan too. So, um, you know, I'm excited about this. I hope that they have... I don't know if it's going to help the editing, but I think that, you know, maybe it'll help the storytelling. Maybe these guys saying, okay, let me see what you have, Snyder. Let me see what you have, Patty Jenkins. No, that's not what I want. This, That's not what we should be doing. This is what we should be doing. You want to throw in more humor in there? Great. If you want to throw in better action sequences, if you want to throw in better dialogue, whatever it takes to get the DC Universe back on track. Like I said, I'm not a big fan of the shared universe idea. But I, I just want to see good movies at the same time. I almost want to see a movie that, you know, can be treated as a standalone, even though it's part of that shared universe, if that makes sense. So while something like, say, Man of Steel is part of this shared universe, it's still as a standalone movie, you're seeing the origins of um, Superman. We didn't get that for Batman. And like I said, if we would have had that, I would have been a lot happier. But that's how it is. So moving on here, um, Harley Quinn spinoff. Yeah, I did want to touch on this really quick. Um, a Harley Quinn spinoff. So, and the reason I mentioned this is because we all know we are only a couple months away from Suicide Squad, which the one and only Batman will be making a rather. I I it, I read a rumor, and I don't want to talk about it just because it's a rumor. Well, it's not a rumor, but it's just. It's a spoiler, if you will, and because I don't want anything because I don't know if you're like me. I like watching trailers. I like watching TV spots, but sometimes, you know, social media and the Internet movie sites, they go a little bit far too far for me because I want to go into the movie and just be surprised. I want to be wild. And so we're not going to talk about that until maybe another time, maybe until after the movie. But we do know that Warner Brothers has greenlit a Harley Quinn spinoff. Not surprising. Is it surprising? I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Um, I got to say that, you know, once again, Warner Brothers might have jumped the gun with this. I do think that they should have waited for Suicide Squad to come out. See how the reception with that movie is going to be. Um, You know... Is Batman going to make a cameo appearance in there? More than likely, because Harley Quinn is the girlfriend of the Joker. So if you're going to have Harley Quinn, you cannot not have the Joker in there, and you can't have Batman not be in that movie. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, like I said, might be too early to announce that. I wish they would have waited till after Suicide Squad so we know what we're what to expect. Um, I have all high hopes for Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. I think she's going to do a great job. I think she's a very talented, up and coming actress, and um, I think she is quite the looker too. So um, looking forward to that. Um, the final news story that we have here is. Warner Brothers has actually confirmed that the dead Robin character in Batman v Superman is Jason Todd. So a couple days ago, the Warner Brothers Studio Tour Hollywood official Facebook page, um, because that's where we go for all our movie news now. Yeah, Uh, they posted a video with a tour guide, John Cornosis, and he provided a live tour of the DC Universe exhibit. Um, If you guys haven't had a chance to see all the pictures from this, it is amazing. They have a whole bunch of new stuff from the Suicide Squad. They have, obviously, the new um, Robin, um, 
the Robin costume that was in Batman v Superman say, you know, the joke's on you, Batman, yada, yada, yada. Um, they have the Superman Wonder Woman outfits in there. They have all kinds of props in there. Definitely check it out. Um, just Google it, DC Universe Exhibit, and uh, definitely something to see. I'll try to find some pictures from it and post it on my Instagram at Batman vs. Bond. Um, anyway, when he got to the Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice Exhibit, um, he revealed that Jason Todd is indeed the dead Robin, quoted saying, This is one of the big things from the Batman v Superman, right across this way. This Jason Todd Robin suit. Spray painted on the front, ha ha, the joke's on you, Batman. Those of you that know the storyline know what happened to this Robin. So what happened to this Robin? If you're a comic book fan, then you knew this obviously more than I did. Um, back in 1988-1989, in the comic A Death in the Family, Batman number 426 through 429, the Joker kidnapped the second Robin, Jason Todd. He then tortured Jason. Um, he beat him with a crowbar and then made his uh, his strange his estranged mother watch. Um, and the Joker left both of them to die in a rigged warehouse to explode. Ouch. Um, yeah, so maybe this puts to cl- this puts some closure on speculation. Obviously, it's not Dick Grayson, but it was actually Jason Todd. My question would be, though, are we going to get have a chance to see this on film? With the whole Ben Affleck standalone, the Batman, whatever they want to call it right now, whenever you know, it's obviously going to be predating the events of Batman v Superman. So I'd be very curious to see if they showed these events in there, and I'd actually like to see it because it would be. I mean, the only sidekick time, or the only time we've had a sidekick for Batman was in <clears throat> Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. I know I have my feelings on those. No, they're not like as bad to me as the Star Wars prequels. But you know, Batman and Robin. If I want to watch a good comedy, I'll turn that on. Um, having said that, though, it would be really cool to see Batman's sidekick in there, and then all of a sudden, you know, because they can, they have this darker approach to it. We can see or get an idea of, say. Um, the Joker kidnapping Jason Todd, and while I we don't have to see it because it's PG thirteen, we can have an idea of what drove Batman Bruce Wayne to be, you know, just to throw up the cape, you know, to end up killing people in Batman v Superman, and I'd really much like to see that. So let me know what your thoughts are on there with that. So moving on here. Um, we had quite a few birthdays this week, and I'm only going to be able to touch on them really quickly, but I can uh, definitely give them some shout outs. So, Jesper Christensen, also known as Mr. White from Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, and Spectre. He just celebrated a birthday on May 16th. Um, by far, probably one of the best villains we've had in quite a long time. Um, what was really interesting about this villain is that, you know, he didn't have the biggest part. But he had a nice size part in there. You know, we saw him all the way beginning from Casino Royale when he was meeting with Lashif and saying, well, that's all my organization can guarantee. And, you know, we saw him kill Lashif and, you know, he Bond caught up with him at the end of Casino Royale and, you know, he had the money and then all of a sudden Bond kneecapped him and then we see him in Quantum of Solace. You see how excited I am about this because he's such a great character. You see him in Quantum of Solace, and he's saying, you really don't know anything about this. The first thing you should know about us is that we have people everywhere. Great, great line. So, and then after that, you know, we know that he got away, and it wasn't all the way up until recently in Spectre that Bond was able to catch back up with him. Turns out that he might be the unofficial number two that was working under Blofeld. And, um, you know, Blofeld wanted him dead. And, uh, you know, how Bond and him were able to have one more interaction. I think that's what I really enjoyed is, the, you know, the, I almost want to say, they, yeah, they did have chemistry. Daniel Craig's James Bond and Jesper Christensen's Mr. White definitely had that kind of chemistry. At the beginning, you know, Bond obviously just wanted to kill Mr. White because of what happened with Vesper. But at the very end, it's like, okay, well, it's to the point that Bond started – I don't want to say looking up to him, but he did kind of respect Mr. White because, you know, he obviously couldn't go through the plans with what Blofeld had, women, children, whatever, and even offered to protect his daughter. So uh, happy birthday to you, Jesper Christensen. The next birthday here um, needs no introduction. Her name is Grace Jones. She played Mayday in A View to a Kill. She celebrated a birthday on May 19th. 
This was an interesting villain, and I gotta say, the most probably the most intimidating villain next to Jaws for me. And I, that's a pretty big thing to say, considering you know Aja, what he can do with his hat. Mayday, though, she's like this very tall, muscular woman, as Q like to say. She must take a lot of vitamins, and I have no doubt that she did. What scares me the most is not her picking up the guy at the horse track, racetrack, in a view to a kill. It was more when. Bond snuck into her bedroom and then she got in bed with Bond and then she climbs on top of Roger Moore and Roger Moore is just like oh my god what happens now oh my god and it's still a classic moment and you know for you youngsters out there well it's a PG movie so you can go it away with saying it but still let's just i'll keep it clean just say that i think mayday might have been the more dominant one in that relationship but grace jones was a great villain and uh you know view to a kill definitely a movie to check out if you haven't already david hedison is our next birthday uh, he played felix slater not once but twice in two different james bond movies live and let die and license to kill now his, he celebrated a birthday on may 20th the interesting part about david hedison's felix slater is that he played with two different James Bonds, two different James Bond actors, that is. And what I like about him, and he, I think he's still my favorite Felix Slater, is that, you know, he had that just kind of laid back, kind of like, hey, I'm Felix Slater, CIA, you know, hey, James Bond, relax, we're in, we're in New Orleans, you know, where's your sense of adventure? And then that was all in Live and Let Die. By the time we get to li- A License to Kill, he's still laid back, but he's, you know, he's running missions on his wedding day, and by the time after he gets married, well, we all know what happened to Della, or, yeah, it's Adela, and, you know, his, one of my favorite quotes from him was, you know, when he's being lowered into that um, shark pool, I guess you could say, by Sanchez, and he's like, I'll see you in hell, and his eyes are coming out of his, you know, his his head, and it was, you know, that's, it was great acting, and I mean, how else can you react to when you're being lowered to when a shark is about to take off your leg? So, I think the the interesting part about this, and I say interesting, is that after his wife had died, after he had lost his leg, they cut into the very end after Bond saves the day. He's in the hospital, and he's back to his old, you know, oh, hi, James, you know, thanks for everything you did. And he's just back to his laid-back kind of sense, you know, his personality. So I really did like that about this guy. And like I said, I think he's probably one of the best Felix Sliders we've had to date. Um, you know, I'm not saying the yellow Felix Sliders weren't good but i think you know I, I still think he's actually better than jack ward you know who was the original felix slider but that's just me anyway um moving on here anthony zerbe who played milton crest in the license to kill he celebrated a birthday on may 20th he was a great baddie you know he really was a great baddie especially in the time you know of a more 80s james bond um you know how he was on the ship and he had probably one of the most bloodiest bloodiest deaths ever in a james bond movie and um that is one i would not let my kids watch until they're age appropriate that's definitely a pg-13 james bond almost borderline r but um i liked what he did with that role Moving on here, Michael Lonsdale celebrates a birthday. He played Hugo Drax in Moonraker, celebrates a birthday on May 24th. Now, Hugo Drax, now this is a guy who's just, he is such, so very calm-mannered, and he never, I don't, the guy like never even had to raise his voice at all. I think he did maybe one time when he yelled at Jaws, but, you know, I mean, I have my thoughts about Moonraker, but as a villain, Hugo Drax is probably one of the best that we had um, compared to like, say, you know, he was like Blofeld, but not. He was like Stromberg, but the Stromberg of space. Instead of trying to conquer underneath the sea, he wanted to conquer space, which is a really interesting concept if you look at it because, okay, let's destroy Earth, and we're going to send the most beautiful people up to Earth, and we're going to start a whole new colony up there. And, you know, just how he was, even to the very end, he's like, now I have, now, Mr. Bond, I have the pleasure of putting you out of my misery. And at the very end, he's still very calm. And, you know, Bond still gets him at the very end, but I really liked him. And um, he's probably one of the more enjoyable um, parts about Moonraker. And uh, this final birthday is none other than Mr. Killian Murphy, who played Scarecrow Dr. Crane. He celebrates a birthday on May 25th. And I would easily say that he's probably one of the unsung villains of the Dark Knight trilogy. Um, he actually is 
you know, let's see, we had Christian Bale, Michael Caine, Morgan Freeman, Gary Oldman, and now him. And he's one of five actors to play in the whole trilogy. And I still say he's underrated because after the whole Batman and Robin you know, movie situation, as I like to call it, you know, it was all about, you know, comedy so much, and it wasn't, the villain couldn't be taken seriously, so where do you go, where do you start off with that when you're rebooting a Batman movie? Well, you start with Scarecrow, and, you know, he gave us a great Scarecrow. We'd never seen Scarecrow before, and he was very chilling, just even playing Dr. Crane. He didn't even need the mask. It's just that look that he had in his eyes. It's just, okay, well, you know, I, I the body, you know, what is the mind? without the body or I, I can I love controlling the mind and so forth and I loved how he made his cameos in the Dark Knight Batman was still able to defeat him and you know um you know it just everything about it oh and the Dark Knight Rises I almost forgot about that when he was in the Dark Knight Rises that you know when he was doing the death or exile scene when he was in the courtroom playing that judge in there loved it loved it and death by exile so happy birthday to you to all of you Moving on to the next segment here, though. we got to keep it moving here. I'm sorry. So this next segment is Versus. This is the newest segment of the Batman vs. James Bond show. This is the part of the show where we compare movies to the Batman and or James Bond universes versus other franchises in the same wheelhouse. So this week's Versus is GoldenEye versus the original Mission Impossible movie starring... Tom Cruise. So lots can be said about this. One was released in 1995, that being GoldenEye. The other was 1996 Mission Impossible. So the way I like to look at this this segment here is it's not a comparison of who did it better. It's just a comparison to how James Bond or Batman movies influence other genres of movies or other franchises. And I think we can easily say that GoldenEye, now that, you know, in that time, go, think back to about um yeah 11 years ago 11 years ago almost that you know james bond was finally back we have pierce Brosnan. we have you know a whole new m we have you a whole new money penny q was still q because that's who q was at the time mr desmond llewellyn but you know a whole new kind of mission and it was for a whole new um a whole new generation if you will and at that same time, you know, the spy movies at the time, I really don't remember too many spy movies being out there. Action movies, it was all about the corny kind of action movies. And I still love the classic action movies. I still love the Lethal Weapons, Die Hards, um, Demolition Mans, and whatever out there. But James Bond, it, it, he was obviously missing. So when James Bond came back, he came back in such a big way. So this was like, okay, Bond is definitely back. He never left, so to speak. He never, he always returns. But seeing Pierce on there, I mean, we had the Aston Martin DB5. We had the Q, we had the watch. We had the Q Labs. We had an amazing, one of the best villains. I know I always say that, but mark my words, 006 Alec Trevelyan is by far one of the best villains out there. And, you know, he's not Blofeld. He's not out for world domination. Alec Trevelyan has a score to settle with MI6 because they didn't tell him about his parents being, um, was it Leonis Cossacks, I believe it was. And, you know, he found out about it. And, you know, now he wants revenge on that. And at the same time, he wants to get back at James Bond because, you know, he's it's almost like he's envious. He's almost jealous of James Bond because, you know, he could never live up to what James Bond is. It's like, you know, you're you're my other brother and, you know, you still, you know, everybody loves you, but everybody doesn't like me, whatever it may be. But it was, it, it's it easily one of the best Bond movies ever. Now, a year later, though, you have Tom Cruise reboot a spy TV series. Now, notice how I said TV series there. Now, I don't know much because I was too young to remember this because, remember, back in 1962, I wasn't even thought of. So, 1962 was when Dr. No came out, the first James Bond movie. It was around the same time after that that Mission Impossible TV series came out. Now... With the Mission Impossible TV series, I think what differentiated it from James Bond is obviously more emphasis on team. It was all about the IMF, Impossible Mission Force. Now, that team together would be having their missions. James Bond, it's all about just James Bond going out there on his own. He has Q, he has his M, he has Money Penny to kind of assist where he needs to, but it's all James Bond all alone on there by himself. When you look at what Ethan Hunt, Tom Cruise, did with the Mission Impossible franchise when he rebooted it and made the part more about him, 
it was um well this at least with this mission impossible movie let's look at this this was probably um it was a great mission impossible movie i remember when this came out and i was very excited about it i was like okay well now i'm into spy movies now i'm into action movies is this is like almost like an american james bond and if you really look at it it really is because who is ethan hunt but he's like this guy with nine lives he can do all kinds of crazy action he can do all these kind of crazy stunts he can just be lowered into the CIA headquarters, come with an inch of the ground, and still kind of like, you know, somehow do like a, I don't even know what that's called with that stunt that he did, where he's kind of waving his arms and he's barely on the ground, but it was great. He can, you know, ex- survive a helicopter explosion. And with him, it wasn't so much about the gadgets. Now, he did have gadgets in there. He had the gum that, you know, the red light, green light. Um, so that can obviously be taken as a James Bond kind of a, not Easter egg, but just it it can relate to James Bond. Now, you also have the glasses in there that you can see through your watch. Easily, that can be a James Bond gadget. Um, I think the more I think about it, actually, is that I could almost see that story from Mission Impossible. So if you don't remember the Mission Impossible movie, first of all, go back and watch. Pause this episode and go back and watch both these movies. Mission Impossible is a great movie. What was interesting about Mission Impossible is that you have the Impossible Mission Force, and they're made up of many teams, but this team was um, – Tom Cruise wasn't quite the leader of the team yet. It was actually um, – Michael, or not Michael Phelps. That's from Maryland, sorry. is made up of Jim Phelps, and Jim Phelps is the head of this who's played by John Voight. John Voight has his team. They're supposed to go in and get something called the knock list. Now, what this knock list is is – this list of agents and it it's from agents all around from the CIA and they're trying to avoid it from getting out to the open. So, you know, he sends Tom Cruise and his team in there, but what happens? Tom Cruise's team gets everybody gets murdered including Jim Phelps, his his leader. And then, you know, the CIA seems to think that it was Ethan Hunt that portrayed he's the mole and that's exactly what this is. This is nothing but a mole hunt. And You've seen this story before, at least in James Bond, maybe more recent. And, you know, like I said, that's the interesting thing when we talk about this segment in Versus is that a lot of the movies, at least franchises, always borrow something off one another. We end up seeing this movie a little later in Skyfall. Maybe we can compare the two eventually. But looking at this, though, I think we can easily say that if it wasn't for GoldenEye, then we probably wouldn't have the Mission Impossible franchise. And... If it wasn't Tom Cruise adding that part, we could easily see James Bond being in this kind of storyline. Okay, Bond, well, you know, we're going to send you in. You need to recover this. And oh, wait, you know, you're, one of your you know, fellow agents was murdered. We believe it was you. And, you know, you're this rogue agent who's trying to sell secrets, sell our agent list to whomever. So, you know, that was my idea with Versus, at least this week. And uh, let me know what you think about it. Uh, Mission Impossible versus Goldeneye. I like similarity differences um it's not always about like which movie was better it's just more about like how james bond and batman can influence these other franchises so that is your verses for the week now on to the matchup of the week this is the segment where we take two different characters from the batman and james bond movie universes and you guys will decide who will win now I've had one hell of a week, let me just say that. Obviously, computer problems, and last week I didn't realize until I went back and listened to the show that I had two James Bond villainesses versus each other. Oops. And I realized that I had two James Bond villainesses versus each other. Oops. It was Fiona Volpe versus Xenia Onatop, and it didn't occur to me until later on, so I posted it online as Catwoman versus Xenia Onatop. Now... We're going to do a whole new matchup, and you know, if you want to cast your vote for that, that's cool. It's already actually been closed on the Twitter poll. But the, po- the uh, matchup I wanted to do this week is going to be, because it happens to be his birthday, Dr. Crane Scarecrow from Batman Begins versus Le Chief from Casino Royale, played by Mads Mikkelsen. So let's look at this really, really quick. Um, yeah, Le Chief is a money man. He is almost to the point of banker. Sure, he can torture you. Sure, he can put you into a chair naked, strap you down, and kind of scratch your balls. 
at the same time, though, you have Dr. Crane, Scarecrow, and even without the mask, he has his nerve toxins. And what does those nerve toxins make you do? They make you hallucinate. And honestly, I think Scarecrow is going to have the upper edge in this. But this is for you guys to decide. Let me know what you think. I'm going to put the Twitter poll up. If By the time you listen to this episode, find it at Batman vs. Bond on Twitter and let me know what you think. So, have we had fun tonight? I know I have. Yes, I'm in a much better mood. Thank you guys for that. So that about wraps it up for this episode of the Batman vs. James Bond show. Please, once again, subscribe on Spreaker and iTunes. Make sure that you rate this show and leave a nice comment for me. Best way to support the show, like I said, guys, is to rate the show and share it. Share with your friends, family members, whomever. Uh, Follow me on Twitter at Batman vs. Bond. Also on Instagram at Batman vs. Bond. I post a whole bunch of content on there. Um, If you're interested in being a guest on the show, please direct message me and we can set something up love to have you on here i'd love to have a little conversation about what your favorite batman movies are james bond movies we can talk a whole bunch of stuff like james bond i will return thank you for listening and until next time peace out